The radical potential of the word mother comes after the M. It is the space that other takes up in our mouths when we say it. We are something else. We know it from how fearfully institutions wield social norms and try to shut us down. We know it from how we are transforming the planet with our every messy step toward making life possible. Mamas who unlearn domination by refusing to dominate their children, extended family and friends, community caregivers, radical childcare collectives, all of us breaking cycles of abuse by deciding what we want to replicate from the past and what we urgently need to transform. We are M othering, mothering ourselves. That was Alexis Pauline Gums. This week, a special Mother's Day edition of The Laura Flanders Show, and Alexis is our guest host, taking us on a journey to explore revolutionary mothering. She's a self-described queer, black troublemaker and black feminist love evangelist. So who better than Alexis Pauline Gums? She's the author of Spill, Fugitive Scenes, coming later this year from Duke University Press. Hi, I'm Alexis Pauline Gums, guest host this week on The Laura Flanders Show, where we'll be discussing revolutionary mothering, Love on the Front Lines, a new book I edited with China Martins and Maya Williams. I'll be speaking to the other editors, as well as contributors Cynthia Dewey-Oka and Victoria Law. When three feet of sunshine, missing two front teeth, asked me why do we need revolution, all I had was a grenade in my mouth. I held him for a while and watched him draw clouds and trees and ladybugs and a house filled with everybody he loves. When was the last time we put to image what we thought the world should be? When did it become enough to know how to promptly explode? I said to him he was much better equipped to figure out the revolution than his mama. That if I don't, he's got to disarm this bomb and throw it out the window. Because the revolution is not about self-defense. It's about self-creation. It's about seeing farther than the walls directly in front of us. And my six-year-old has got a head start. I wrote haikus drawing from the words that these brilliant revolutionary mothers used in pieces they wrote in the book as one way of introducing them. Of course, you should Google all of them to get the full genius, but this is just a way to bring us in. For Maya, not cute or tidy, glimpses of revolution every single day. For China, tall and graceful tree, sacred nature of writing, leaving quilted words. For Cynthia, this self-creation, reclaim our generations, encumbrance throws down. And for Vicky, we all are welcome. Enough passion for again, the world is transformed. So those are 17 syllables from each of these writers in the anthology Revolutionary Mothering. Obviously, you want to read all the other syllables because they're amazing. And as we bring this Revolutionary Mothering genius in, I just wanted to ask each of you to invoke somebody who's not here in the studio with us, but who to you represents Revolutionary Mothering. If you want to shout out their name and maybe how they taught you what Revolutionary Mothering might be. Why don't we start with you, Cynthia? <laughs> okay. Um, I am going to shout out Joy Harjo. She is a Native American poet and artist and storyteller and musician. Um, I think the best thing that she has taught me about revolutionary mothering is the bridging work that she's willing to do uh, cross culturally, cross um, many, many social barriers. Um, I feel like she has crossed oceans um, in the ways that she's been willing to allow me to reach her and for her to reach me. Uh, so, Joy Harjo. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Can I continue, Maya? Um, I was actually sort of weighing this for a second, but I think um, Asada Shakur, 
And I think because of the level of sacrifice that she gave. It is one thing to mother a child and it's another thing to mother a revolution and to make the level of sacrifice to, that you can't even be with your child in that, you know, for a good part of their lives. Awesome, thanks. It's my grandmother, Elsie Fahrenholt, um, because she was so fierce and she was my first babysitter. I think for me, it's uh, a woman who has since joined the ancestors, a woman named Carmen Rubio, who was a Lower East Side housing activist, squatter, tenants rights organizer. And when my daughter was first born, kind of took us both under her wing and showed us what revolutionary mothering could be from someone who made a deliberate choice never to have her own children, but was involved in my daughter's life, was involved in the lives of so many children in her building, in her neighborhood, had started a community garden specifically for children. And this idea that mothering isn't just biological, but it could be part of the community. Mm -hmm. Oh, y'all are so brilliant. I love that we have people who have helped mother literary movements, who have mothered political movements, who have mothered us and who have mothered alongside of us. Mm -hmm. I think that that's really beautiful. And one of the things I know that our intention was explicitly with this book is to make some of those actions that they may be in the home, they may be in movements that um, the information about them is suppressed, they may be in writing letters to other authors, mentoring other authors, and um, they may be in the archive, like. Joy Harjo is one of the people who you see writing letters of encouragement to other women writers of color over and over again. And that's a form of mothering work, but only those writers see it, and then the nosy people who go in the archive. But that's another story. One of the things we wanted to make visible with the book is, well, what would the impact on the world be if the implications of those actions that are often known about only by the, f the few people, even though it saves those people's lives, what if those were known on a larger scale? And what would we say? witnessing those actions from the inside of those actions on a grander scale. So the next question I wanted to ask you all is if you knew that everyone in the world was going to be impacted by something you know is true about revolutionary mothering, what would you want them to know? I think I would say that, um, and I think I've said it before, it's sort of like, I'm going to get this tattooed to me the amount of times I've said it, is that we are not the ones destroying the earth. Mm. Like, I think that for me is, I think that there's a lot of, um, I mean, you talk about the 1980s and Ronald Reagan, you know, you can talk about the welfare mother, you can talk about how immigrant mothers, you can talk about how poor mothers mm -hmm. are always the ones who are castigated and their children, of course, because, um, you know, all they can do is give birth to is, quote unquote, more problems that they are also blamed for, you know, everything from economic, you know, um, from the economic crisis to uh, the environmental degradation, you know, I, and, and I just really always want to be like, we are not the ones who are destroying this mm -hmm. earth. Mm -hmm. You know, the 2008 Wall Street crash didn't happen because of mothers, you know? <laughs> like, we are not the ones who have been pumping poisons into the earth for the past 150 years, especially. You know, we are the ones who actually are standing on the front lines, we are the ones who are actually the ones who are the most impacted by these, you know, horrible decisions. We are the ones who are actually the for, at the first place for having to deal with it. You know, there's a reason, for instance, that you know, black women have an infant and maternal mortality rate that's somewhere between two to four times higher than other people in the country. We are not the ones who are destroying the earth. We are the ones who, one, are the most impacted, and we are, two, the ones who are creating the systems and communities and ecologies that are actually going to save this earth, if anything is going to. So if I could, if I could say that, if I could just get that into everybody else's head <laughs> to like trust mothers and trust us to build communities and stop blaming us and punishing us and taking away resources from us mm -hmm. to be able to do really basic life-giving work, I think that would be... Excellent. Mm -hmm. Yes, it would. Yeah. Awesome. <laughs> yeah. Other folks, what would you say? To change revolution style now, like everywhere, all around you, there's invisible mothering labor going on. There's answers to like how you always say, like, you know, to actually save the planet. Like everywhere this is going on. And it's like, open your eyes, listen to people, bring in that leadership. You know, I want to see it everywhere. If somebody is struggling with childcare at work or like in the newspaper, who works at the newspaper or 
every single element everywhere. Just look at the mother around you, the mothering, mm -hmm. maybe not biological mother, the person who's taking care of things, the person who's making things exist, and listen to them, put them in the middle, and follow. <laughs> what would you say, Vicky? I would, I would agree with China that it's not revolutionary mothering, it's not biological, so we need to recognize that it happens all over, it's crucial, and it's doable, so you don't have to say, well, I'm not a mother, or I'm not a parent, or I don't, I don't have children. It's something that anyone can do, and it's this revolutionary act of being in community and being part of a community, and it's not an isolated nuclear family instance that some people supposedly choose to be part of and some people choose not to be. Okay. Yeah, and what would you add, Cynthia? I mean, kind of building off of everyone, I think, there is no movement without mothering. So, you know, I think that it's really, really important um, for organizers, for thinkers, for scholars, for cultural workers, um, struggling for change in this country, in the world, to really recognize that, it's, that we need the buy-in and we need the centrality of people who are caregivers and it's not an option, actually, because you cannot sustain your movement without that practice, without that expertise, and without people training other folks inside of the movement to become proficient at mothering, to be able to do that with each other, um, and to kind of, because it really is the practice of continuing. Mm -hmm. And transformation doesn't happen, act, like it doesn't happen like that, right? Like we wish, but it doesn't. <laughs> it happens in this reiterative way. It happens in this kind of like in the mundane repetitions that actually doesn't happen in the giant eruptions. Mm -hmm. Those giant eruptions can signal that there are like major issues at stake, major rifts at stake, but how we actually pivot from that is in daily practice and that is nowhere better embedded and better established than in mothering practice. So I feel like it is imperative uh, for movements to really take that seriously. Um, you won't exist without mothers. Absolutely. So, so those people who are gonna make t-shirts to fundraise for the Revolutionary Mothering Tour, we are not the ones destroying the planet. We are everywhere, we are everyone. There's no movement without mothers. Those are all great t-shirt ideas. I'm just <laughs> letting whoever's watching know that. <laughs> and then the last question I was going to ask actually draws on what you were saying, Cynthia, about those intimate mundane moments where mm -hmm. this revolutionary work is always happening. And I just wanted to ask you if, if y'all would be generous enough to share something that you've learned in the intimate space of mothering your children, like something that your child has taught you recently that is transforming the way that you think now. Can we start with you, Vicki? Yeah. So my daughter is now 15. And what I've learned, you know, over and over and over is that even though she's a teenager, which means she's developing her own personality and she is her own person, um, every, everything that we've done together has been like a you know, has built a foundation for, you know, like the things that she believes, the ways that she acts, the ways that she reacts to injustice. And it may not necessarily always be like what I, you know, like what I would do, you know, like in my, you know, very correct political way, but you know, like, like I can see the ways in which she has taken in those values and how she acts upon them. Hmm. And Cynthia, what's something you've learned recently? Something I've learned recently from my son who is, he's turning 13 this year, and I'm very proud of him. He wants to be a musician. And very recently, he successfully crowdfunded nearly $1,500 in order to purchase a mellophone, um, <laughs> which is essentially a French horn for a marching band because we couldn't afford it. So what I learned from him watching him in the past few years, you know, is, and I think in particular mothers have been so deeply conditioned to not want things. Mm -hmm. right to feel like when we want things it's mm -hmm. wrong or it's indulgent um, and I learned from him that we should want things <laughs> that we should follow our passion that we should involve other people in the pursuit of that passion and that we should take pride in the things that we are passionate about and that seems so simple 
but it's, it was a very difficult lesson to learn. I was a young mom. I had my son when I was 17. So the messaging that I heard from all around me, I had to hide my pregnancy the whole time I was pregnant, was be ashamed of who you are. Mm -hmm. Be ashamed of, I mean, I still have questions and worries about showing up at public events for my son because it's, you know, you're always like, really, he's your son? Mm -hmm. I don't, you don't, how old were you when you had him? And that's always the mm -hmm. first question mm -hmm. that happens. And then after you answer that question, all of the judgments mm -hmm. that proceed, that, that come after, right? Mm -hmm. um, so I think, you know, he has been so open and brave about who he is. And uh, I'm, I am taking notes. I'm taking notes on being strategic and naming the things that you want because that's something I've seen from him is that every stage of his life he'll be like these are my goals now mm -hmm. these are my goals now these are the this is the person I want to be and he's always identified that mm -hmm. and it took me a long time to answer the question what do I want right so mm -hmm. yeah beautiful I mean, I already said you all are brilliant, but I can never say it too many times. I think that there are going to be a lot of people watching this who are getting affirmation from what you've shared already, certainly from what you've shared in the book, about their revolutionary mothering work and whether that work is showing up or those revolutionary mothering actions are showing up in organizations or in their families or really with their work to remother themselves and to think about how that could operate revolutionarily. If you could offer like a one-sentence affirmation for somebody who might be watching this, who might want affirmation to take them through, like something they could put on their mirror and see and see themselves through that affirmation as opposed to through the different judgments that we talked about, through the oppressive narratives that we talked about earlier, something to displace that. What would you say to that one person who is wanting to sustain their revolutionary mothering work? That you are perfect. You know, mm. that's like the ultimate, the ultimate mothering, the ultimate like look of love. Yeah, beautiful. Thank you for that. <laughs> What would you say, Cynthia? I would say, when you think you're empty, you're not. Mm -hmm. What about you, Maya? What would you say as an affirmation? I think I already said it. I think I said I would get it tattooed, which is we are just not the ones destroying the earth. And what about you, Vicky? What would you say as an affirmation? What you're doing, no matter how small it seems, is actually really important. Mm -hmm. So thank you all so much for your generosity, for your brilliance, for transforming every positive and negative experience that you've had into wisdom that is shareable in the form of this moment, this show, but also in the form of the book. And if folks want to find out more about revolutionary mothering, you can go to this bridge called mybaby.wordpress.com, see where we're going to be on our national tour and find out more about the book itself. And you can also see more at lauraflanders.com. For Ebony Wilkerson, a black mother who drove herself and her children into the Atlantic Ocean, saying she was taking them all to a better place. One, how can I protect them, says the pregnant mother, three children behind her, brown as ever, minivan plastic, right-handed lever, we will be okay as long as we're together. She drives out of town and then drives to her sister to dodge all the demons that twist her and twist her. Ebo ungrounded, the people could fly, not in a Honda Odyssey, but she had to try. And as soon as the rubber sank into the surf, all the ghosts grabbed the wheels and said, yes, yes, that works, come home and the seafloor scattered, the large and smaller bones of all those other mothers who didn't swim and their kin. Two, is the walk on water gene recessive, regressive, repressed by the stresses of modern minivan life, a passed on secret activated by a serum in the heat of the blood of abused wives? And what is the crazy part? to believe the weight of metal and plastic can float, to remember what it feels like to be shackled in a boat, or to think there is a better place underneath or across, some way to get back, 
when we're lost. Three. Mom is crazy, they tell the police. She's trying to kill us. Have you ever felt that? The most scared I've ever been in my life is in the back seat of an SUV driven by my mother in rage. I have known she could kill us all with the same thick, wild determination she used to get us here. All this huge car metal and no way to escape. The hurricane cycles of abuse, the repeated betrayals, Single mother, broke breadcrumbs, breed real demons that are not us. And they don't stop screaming. It's just that most days, something else is louder. Call it love, or inertia, or luck. Have you ever seen a woman drive like capitalism is chasing her off the edge of herself? Kids in the back, purse in the front seat, I have, and I am a pretty strong swimmer, but still. I was in a car when I first heard your name, nowhere near the beach, and I had to pull over. Four, how many women have wanted to take their jewelry off, dive back in, take their children with them to where everything is eventually warm enough, big enough, deep enough to save us? If you listen to everything the ocean has to say, how can you stand it? How can you stay? Heavy swimmer bodies remember wet, dark places that held us when we were ready to transform. Gut brave enough to breathe a different way. <sighs> Five. Ebony, you almost made it, but your body brought you back and the tourists saved the children, and now you are just as black and wearing orange in gray rooms where they test your pee for the alcohol level of cough medicine. Is someone sending you books by Toni Morrison, by Kate Chopin? Ebony, you are not the only woman crazy enough to remember that some days we just cannot. We cannot live here. We cannot give our babies to this world that eats our bones like centuries of salt. And I am sending love to the South Carolina centuries that protected the part of you that hears the ocean and believes there has to be a better place, even if neither of us can see it from here right now. And to your babies who survived, they will one day understand. Walking on water, one day the sky will open and he will walk into the storm without you, without words written down. You can picture crows beating against the window, flashes of skyscraper in the furious cloud. On the sidewalk, cardboard homes dissolve. You are afraid he will find his father amid the shaking branches of bone, though you've tried to whittle him like an arrow. Look straight ahead and feel which direction the wind is blowing. Years ago, a circle of women and kids stood in rain like this, making a roof of their singing. He was there, with you and the megaphone's failed thunder. Pickets clapped the air, the street polished to a mirror. A man, cursing, gunned his truck into the crowd, and you, without a single thought, stepped in front of it. This, always half marooned by poems, is the only mothering you have perfected. You hope he will forgive you one day, when he feels the stones pressing into his feet and sees how words are made of breath, which, like love, are born of disappearing things. A mother is nothing if not a kind of hope for the sky to open, the storm to be a world scissored with light.
Thanks to Alexis Pauline Gums and her co-contributors for taking us on that journey. You can see more about revolutionary mothering at our website. Or write to me, laura at lauraflanders.com. And thanks. <laughs>